This is a very controversial area. I don't have a clear-cut answer. I wish I did. And I'm a urologist so about you know, whether we should screen or not to screen. There are big policy implications, just not for our patients, but also uh, for the public health and, and, the, and the country as a whole. So uh, just some disclosures. I have no disclosures. Uh, I am funded by uh, ASCO for a career development award and an R01 to actually help improve accurate surveillance for men who are treated with prostate cancer, who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. So some quick epidemiology. Prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed malignancy among men in the United States. 30,000 men die of prostate cancer each year. It's the second most common cause of cancer-related mortality in the United States. And why do we screen? So, you know, this is from President Nixon. We screen because we hope to detect cancers earlier such that we could treat them so they're not symptomatic, we can provide higher cure rates, uh, and provide more effective treatment. And so what are the traditional methods, methods of screening? So as we know, it's PSA testing and digital rectal exam. Um, there are new emerging technologies out there, the MRI and prostate biomarkers. I would say that the last two, which are not the folks in my talk, are emerging uh, uh, methods of diagnosis. There isn't really great high-level evidence about the last two, so I'll focus on, the, on PSA testing mostly. So this is an area of controversy. I don't, I don't have the clear-cut answer here because if you look at a panel of guidelines, there is no consensus about whether we should screen or not. And it can go as extreme as the most recent uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force, which said issued a grade D recommendation, recommendations that we shouldn't screen any man who's at average risk for prostate cancer. And they released this at you know, May of 2012 at the AUA in our national meeting. It created a lot of consternation amongst urologists. And they predicated it based on two things. One, the evidence for screening is not great, and I admit that. And two, as a urologist and someone who treats um, prostate cancer commonly, we overtreat a lot of prostate cancer. We recognize that, and hopefully we're improving. And the AAFP, um, the American uh, Association of Family Practice, agreed with them. They said, this is a grade D recommendation. We are harming patients by screening them. The AUA backed off. <laughs> we initially recommend screening at age 50, which was not the best evidence either. We backed off in response saying we should screen patients between ages 55 to 69 years of age after having a thorough discussion of the risks and benefits and engaging in shared decision makings for patients. And the American Cancer Society, Dr. Oz Brawley, also, they have not changed their guidelines, issues a similar recommendation about screening men after having a thorough discussion about the risks and benefits and having shared decision making for patients who have a greater than 10-year life expectancy starting at the age of 55. So like, we're at this crossroads. Like, I, I, I admit it, I don't have the clear cut answer. When patients come to me asking this question, I don't have the answer. So we're sort of at this fork in the road right now. So there are two ways of looking at prostate cancer screening, in my opinion. One is that you can say, well, we should not screen because, you know, we're, these older patients who we treat on the right um, don't need treatment. We're harming them by exposing them to a biopsy, and the vast majority of patients who are getting treated. The converse of that argument is that if you don't screen, we'll go back to the days of the 1980s where you have men up here in the top right who have metastatic prostate cancer at presentation. If you are a in favor of screening or not in favor of screening, if you screen, screen patients, you know, we have a lot of great technologies out there to treat patients with robotic surgery, proton beam, and we could cure a lot of patients, possibly. But also you could argue that we're overtreating the vast majority, not the vast majority, a third of patients with localized prostate cancer. So um, I found this article uh, really interesting. This gained a lot of press. Um, Richard Ablin wrote this very controversial piece saying that the PSA test was the biggest mistake in medicine, and this was particularly relevant because he invented it. He was a PhD scientist at Washington University, wrote this very controversial piece saying that he regretted ever actually discovering the PSA test because we were over-diagnosing and over-treating a lot of men for prostate cancer. And Gilbert Walsh, when I was being recruited at Dartmouth when I finished my fellowship, published this very controversial article showing that since the advent and the introduction of the PSA test, we have diagnosed one million men of prostate cancer. Of those one million men, 90% of them in the United States are getting treated. I would argue that a third of these men probably did not need treatment. And, you know, how do we do, you know, a PSA? How do we get to diagnosis of prostate cancer? Well, we do a digital rectal, um, we do a trust biopsy um, and a digital rectal exam. And it's important to note that the trust biopsy is not that accurate. Two-thirds of men undergo a biopsy and it's negative, right? And 30% of men will have hematospermia, hematuria, and rectal bleeding, and that's relatively minor in my opinion. But the one more alarming thing is that 1.5% of men 
will be admitted for your substance. That number has actually increased from 0.4 to 1.5 recently based on senior Medicare data because the ubiquitous use of antibiotics. The other thing, too, is that, you know, the U.S. Preventive Task Force really um, called into question the benefit of PSA testing because the vast majority of patients in the United States are getting treated. 90% of men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer either undergo surgery or radiation. And if you look at, I mean, if you're critical about my specialty and what I specialize in, there is no single treatment I could say is superior. There's no clinical trial comparing surgery to radiation, and that trial will never happen because the large number of patients that will need to be accrued, and moreover, patients simply will not do. We tried that in the 1990s and it accrued horribly. And the last thing, too, is, you know, if you're very honest, surgery and radiation are associated with significant quality of life implications. And so this is a busy graph, and I, I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but Matt Resnick's a friend of mine at Vanderbilt. He published a patient, this paper in New England Journal of Medicine, and it was sobering. And the two messages I want to say is that if patients undergo surgery or radiation, at least a third of patients will have significant urinary incontinence at 15 years. And the bottom graph here is even more sobering. At 15 years, the vast majority of patients will have issues with erectile dysfunction following surgery or radiation. And Bruce Jacobs is a friend of mine at UPIT. He published this paper, and this is why my specialty in urology and radiation oncology has sort of become the target of CMS, because we are over-treating patients. So uh, Bruce Jacobs looked at this data using serum Medicare data. For low-risk prostate cancer, I would argue active surveillance should be an integral part of the discussion. And as you can see here on the left, at least 40% of patients in the United States who have low-risk prostate cancer are getting treatment. The other thing about prostate cancer, it's an indolent disease process. I measure outcomes at 10 years. If patients have less than a 10-year survival, I would argue they shouldn't be treated, irrespective of their stage, irrespective of their risk stratification. And in the United States, 50% of patients who have a less than 10-year life expectancy are receiving treatment. And the other reason why PSA testing causes harm is because we're biased, uh, urologists and radiation costs in particular. And I was funded previously this national survey, and the, you know, the, the the take-home message here is if you ask urologists, what is the best treatment? Surgery. If you ask radiation oncologists, what is the best treatment? Radiation therapy. And the small minority of specialists said active surveillance is the best, and that's on the far right. So if you're in the campus saying, well, like, you know, the AUA really endorses uh, PSA um, testing and prostate cancer screening. And if you're in the campus saying, well, look, like, it's beneficial, <laughs> um, you could say that since the 1980s, when we introduced PSA testing, there has been a stage migration from locally advanced disease to organ confined disease. And second, there's been a reduction in prostate cancer specific mortality. So this paper nicely shows that 1980, 1987, 89 on the far left, 80% of patients had disease outside the prostate. 1996, that went down to 50% due to PSA testing. And notice Brawley, who is uh, the uh, president of the ECS, American Cancer Society, who is not a big fan of PSA testing, published this paper saying that if you look at the bottom, since the introduction of PSA testing, the mortality of prostate cancer has gone down over time. So I just want to look at this grade D recommendation uh, for the U.S. Preventive Task Force. It's based on two clinical trials. I think to be informed about the discussion, I think we should thoroughly look at the evidence. And so um, Virginia Moore published this result saying that we should not screen people based on these two trials. And if you look at the, the meta-analysis here, you can clearly see like there's only really one group or subgroup in Sweden where if you randomize patients where PSA testing improved prostate cancer survival. But if you look at the evidence more carefully, I would argue that these, some of these trials were a little bit flawed. So the PLCO trial led by Gerald Andrew at WashU randomized about 76,000 patients from 10 academic centers from 1993 to 2010 randomized to usual care or screening with a PSA or DRE. Indications for biopsy were a PSA of greater than four or an abnormal DRE. And as you can see in this trial on the top graph here, if you got screened, you're going to get diagnosed. I mean, that's, it makes sense. But the more telling thing, the more sobering thing for urologists and primary care providers is that for those who were screened and not screened, there was no difference in prostate cancer survival. So their conclusion was there was no evidence that prostate cancer improved survival from, from this malignancy. I would argue, though, and this is even Gerald Andrew, who's a urologist who ran the trial, said this was not was a flawed state for this following reason. Two-thirds of men 
who were randomized underwent screening prior to the trial. So it was not a pristine trial. Furthermore, 50% of men who were in intervention arm were not compliant with the protocol. If you look at the European trial, seven countries randomized, 55 to 74 to either control arm or screen with a PSA or DRE, uh, and a DRE uh, for four years. And here, as you can see in this trial, screening actually did improve prostate cancer survival. And their conclusion that screening was associated with an absolute reduction of 0.71 prostate cancer deaths per 1,000 men at a mean fall of 8.8 .8 years. To prevent one prostate cancer death, you need, invited, you need to invite 1,000 men to be screened and you need 37, to be, 37 men to be treated. Now, you could argue, and I don't have the right answer, but you know, is the number needed to treat worthwhile? It, it, it's a very controversial statement. There's a lot of men who need to be screened, a lot of net men who need to be treated to save one life. So the other thing about the, the U.S. Preventive Task Force is that they hinged their grade D recommendation, recognized the fact that 90% of men in the United States are getting treated for prostate cancer. I would argue a third of them do not. And the NCCN um, recently talked about accurate surveillance and encouraged it. And if you look at their guidelines, low risk prostate cancer, no nodule on, on DRE, PSA less than 10, a Gleason score of less than six, even if they have a greater than 10 year life expectancy, 10 year life expectancy should be talked to about accurate surveillance because the risk of prostate cancer death is 1%. Now I certainly could do surgery and offer this patient radiation to make that zero. But based on the previous slides for all the quality of life implications, that is a discussion that should be had with the patient. And actual surveillance should be now an integral part of the discussion for lowest prostate cancer patients. And um, I just point this to this great trial by Larry Kloss. I actually know him. He's a, he's a very nice guy. He's a urologist in Toronto. And I remember in 1990, he got up in front of the room of urology and said, you know, for lowest prostate cancer, like, I don't know if we, treat, we should be treating these patients. They have lowest disease. And I cannot tell you the... Uh, <laughs> amount of um, name calling he was called because he's a urologist. I mean, he's a surgeon, it's cancer, we should get it out. And he did this trial to prove people wrong and he ultimately was right. So he enrolled 819 men with lowest prostate cancer in Toronto. He said, I don't know what the right evidence is, but let's just watch you and see what happens. Over a period of 10 years, about half of these men ended up getting treated because their PSA went up, the Gleason went from six to seven, or their DRE exam worsened. The most telling thing though, the thing that got the press, was that only 1.5% of men died. 1.5%. And he proved urologists who were very in favor of treatment wrong, and rightfully so. And um, Dr. Zager mentioned this earlier. So you know, I found this very interesting. Like I was preparing this talk, and um, I'm a urologist, and I do, I do subscribe to the Annals of Internal Medicine. <laughs> but, um, I saw this, it came across my desk. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. Like they're, they're talking about high value care and advice for cancer screening. And in the setting of the US Preventive Task Force, you know, I found their, their discussion very interesting because ultimately, if you look here at the bottom for prostate cancer, this mirrors the AUA guidelines. For patients who are 55 to 69, we should have informed discussions about the risks and benefits of screening. And if a patient wants to pursue screening, that's a worthwhile thing to do. So to screen or not to screen, um, I don't have the right answer. There's not a lot of great evidence out there. I would point out one thing which I didn't include in this graph. Um, there are two cancers in the Cuyahoga County which we do worse on from a survival perspective compared to the national average, and that's prostate cancer and cervical cancer. We are by far the worst. I was on faculty at Yale about a year ago, and I was commenting to my friend how many, friend, how many patients I've been seeing with locally advanced disease. I don't know what the reason is, but the Prostate, prostate cancer outcomes in this county are worse than the national average. And so what I would recommend is that for patients between the age 50 to 69 with a greater than 10 year life expectancy, we should offer PSA screening after a thorough discussion about the risks and benefits. The screening should include a DRE and a PSA. It should not occur in men who are greater than 70 years old who have a less than 10 year life expectancy or for patients who simply say, look, I read the risks and benefits, and I simply do not want to be screened. Who should get a biopsy? I would argue there's a lot of good evidence for, until we have better technology, in particular the MRI, for patients who have a PSA greater than four, they should be referred to urology for a, a biopsy or an abnormal DRE. 
I would encourage you to refer to urologists who will work with primary care doctors about discussing the role of a biopsy and then also the role of treatment. Um, I've been here uh, for about 10 months now and I was in Connecticut for two years prior to this. There are a lot of misaligned incentives when it comes to prostate cancer and treatment decisions. In particular, the use of the robot, IMRT, and now the proton beam. I think it's important that we, whoever you ultimately refer to, you make sure that you refer to your rod, who will discuss the risks and benefits of treatment and also highlight the importance of active surveillance because the U.S. Preventive Task Force did have one thing wrong because they hinge a lot of their discussion based on overtreatment. I was recently at the last AUA, and I don't have the slides because the papers have been published. Urologists are responding. We are not treating as much low-risk prostate cancer in the nation as before. So I would really encourage you to find that urologist who will work with you to make sure that patients are fully informed about the implications of both screening, biopsy, and treatment. Thank you very much. I really have that. I really appreciate it.